of uh, having Wally Steele back from Custer, South Dakota. Um, he was here on the 16th, I believe it was. I wasn't here that day. But uh, he's going to come and bring us a message in uh, 2 Peter, continuing on with our, our, uh, our theme of covering the book. So uh, here's Wally. Thank you. I can Got it. Well, the first thing, when I came before, my wife had jury duty, and she couldn't come, and I've never heard the end of it, because the day after I got here, they called her up and said, we're not going to have the trial. <laughs> and uh, so I wanted to introduce my wife, Pat. Why don't you come here, Pat? And... So she got to come this time, and I'm sort of excited about that, because I wanted her to meet everybody, and. I had tried to describe, you know how hard it is to describe people? I tried to figure out how to describe Ernie over and over and over again. <laughs> and it was sort of difficult, but you could pick him out, couldn't you? So uh, it worked. You know, I, I uh, like to begin each of my, my prayers with a, 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 or each of my sermons with a prayer. So will you pray with me? Heavenly Father, as I, become, as I come before you this morning, I pray my words are your words. Lord, you have given me the Holy Spirit as a guide, a teacher, and a comforter. Let the words that flow from me come from the freedom of your leading. I pray that the message I share today will honor your will. Let the words this week be more than words, and let the sermon be what we need to hear. This, Father, I pray in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Amen. I'll be bringing the, the message today from 2 Peter, the first chapter, the 16th through the 21st verse. The first letter that Peter wrote that we often call 1 Peter was written to encourage Christians who were suffering terrible persecutions from outside the church. They were being persecuted because they were Christians, being persecuted by the world around them. The second letter that I'm going to be preaching from today is warning Christians of a danger within the church. A little bit of a different perspective, isn't it? The first letter was warning about the danger outside the church, and the second letter is warning about the danger inside the church. In the verses that lead up to the 16th verse, Peter has laid a foundation of how to grow in your relationship with Christ and to be firmly established in the truth. Peter reminds us that he walked and talked with Jesus and that he does not mind reminding us over and over and over again what the truth is. Now I'll begin in the 16th verse of 2 Peter, the first chapter. It says, and I'm, I'm using a scripture from the New American Standard Bible. We did not follow cleverly devised myths or tales when we made known to you the power and the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, but we have been eyewitnesses of his majesty. First in this verse, Peter is telling me as a pastor, when I preach, not to get caught up in other books, not to speculate about this or that, but to stick to the Word of God. Amen. Today we have a Bible that records the words of those who walked and talked with Jesus as well as the words of Jesus Christ. Those are what we need to share today. You know, Peter is telling us to learn about God, about Jesus, about your spiritual walk from those who lived it. In Peter's case, he was an eyewitness to the events when they actually happened. And he is writing, when what he is writing is the truth, the truth that you and I are to believe. It's a job of whoever stands up here to share every time the power and reality of Jesus Christ from the Bible. Because that's where the truth is, isn't it? It's in the scriptures. We live in a world today, and I, I love it when uh, one of our politicians speaks and they come up and they have fact checkers or truth checkers. Don't you like that? Uh, it's sad to me that our leaders wouldn't be 
truthful. That can't happen up here. We need to always share the Word of God as honestly and as truthfully as we can. You know, Peter is devoting much of the scripture to tell people of that time to do exactly that in the church, though. You are to be truth checkers, aren't you? If it's not being shared, if truth is not being shared up here, you need to be truth checkers. You know, the, de the danger within the church at that time where Peter is talking about when he says, we did not follow cleverly devised myths or tales when we made known to you the power and the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ, but we have been eyewitnesses of majesty, was that false prophets had entered the church, the church itself. And in this case, Peter was telling the people that the second coming of Christ is real. And you know what the false prophets were saying? It's not going to happen. Or if it is going to happen, we'll tell you exactly the date. Can you do that? Because the Lord is going to choose that date when he chooses that date, isn't he? You know, Peter was a first-hand witness to the power of Jesus Christ, and he wanted the people to know that he had been an eyewitness to the majesty of God and of Jesus Christ. An eyewitness. You know, and then he said, I shall always be ready to remind you of these things, even though you already know them. In other words, repetition is the key to learning, isn't it? Commercials know that, don't they? You only see a commercial one time, right? Over and over and over again. In fact, sometimes you get sick of seeing the same commercial, but you can remember the words. Educators know that repetition is the key to knowledge because they want you to repeat over and over and over again. I need to do that often because my memory is getting really bad. But uh, I have my wife who stands next to me and she has a gift of remembering names. And so when you go out, if she remembers your name, she tells it to me and I really look good. <laughs> you know, Peter was there with Jesus Christ. And Matthew, the eighth chapter, is an example of Peter being with Jesus, and it says this. Then he got in the, into the boat, and it's talking about Jesus got in the boat, and his disciples followed him. Without warning, a furious storm came upon the lake, so that the waves swept over the boat. But Jesus was sleeping. The disciples went over, and they woke him up, saying, Oh, you are, are saying to us, Lord, save us, we're going to drown. Jesus got up and he said, oh, if you, you of little faith, why are you so afraid? Then he got up, he rebuked the winds and the waves, and it was completely calm. The men were amazed, and they said, what kind of man is this? Even the winds and the waves obey him. You know, Peter experienced Jesus Christ and his power and his miracles. Another time, you know, in Matthew 14, 22, Jesus had just fed 5,000 people with two fish and five loaves. If that wasn't miracle enough, this took place right after that. It says, immediately, Jesus made his disciples go and get into the boat and go ahead of him on to the other side while he dismissed the crowd. After he dismissed them, he went up to the mountainside by himself to pray. When evening came, he was there alone, but the boat was already a considerable distance from the land, buffeted by the waves because the wind was against it. During the fourth watch of the night, Jesus went out to them, walking on the lake. When the disciples saw him walking on the lake, they were terrified. It's a ghost, one of them yelled. And they cried out in fear. But Jesus immediately said to them, Take courage, take courage, it is I, don't be afraid. Lord, if it's you, Peter replied, tell me to come out to you on the water. And Jesus simply said, Come. Peter got down out of the boat, and he walked on the water, and came toward Jesus. But when he saw the wind, he was afraid, and beginning to sink, he cried out, Lord, save me. Immediately, Jesus reached out his hand 
and caught him. You of little faith, he said. Why did you doubt? And when they climbed into the boat, the wind died down. And then those who were in the boat worshipped him, saying, Truly, truly, you are the Son of God. Did Peter know the power of Jesus Christ? Yes, he did. He experienced it. I had a college professor that used to say uh, to us over again, how many miracles in your life does it take you to notice just one? Now I'm 74 years old, I can look back on my life and I see time after time after time that I thought was a disaster when Jesus picked me up and made something good happen out of it. Miracle after miracle after miracle. Yes, Peter knew the power of Jesus, and by the time he wrote this letter, he had no doubt. It took Peter going through many miracles to finally accept the greatest gift of all. And even then, it took him time, didn't it? You know, Peter writes, when we made known to you the power, and then he says, the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. There were false prophets in the church telling the, to the people in the church, what? There's not going to be a second coming. Peter wants you to know there is a second coming. That word coming, where he's using that in the 16th verse, is the Greek word parousia. That is also found in the third chapter of the fourth verse and in the third chapter of the twelfth verse. And they all refer to the second coming of Christ. Peter was telling them there is going to be a second coming. And then he says, for when... He received honor and glory, the Father, in 74. Such an utterance was made to him for the majestic glory. This is my beloved Son, my beloved, whom I love and I am well pleased. And we ourselves heard this utterance made from heaven. And we were with him on the holy mountain. Peter is making reference to a time, another time when he was with Jesus Christ. And he saw the power of God encountering Jesus Christ. And we call it the transfiguration. Hopefully later on I'll preach a whole sermon on this, but right now I'm just going to read it. It's in Matthew, I'm going to, the event I'm going to read is Matthew 17, verses 1 through 9. After six days, Jesus took with him Peter, James, and John, the brother of James, and led them up to a high mountain by themselves. There he was transfigured before them. His face shone like the sun, and his clothes became as white as light, just then there appeared before them Moses and Elijah talking with Jesus. Peter said to Jesus, Lord, it's good for us to be here. If you wish, we'll put up three shelters or three altars for you. One for Moses, one for Elijah, and one for you. While he was still speaking, a bright cloud enveloped them. And a voice from the cloud said, this is my son whom I love. With him I am well pleased. Listen to him. When the disciples heard this, they fell face down on the ground, terrified. But Jesus came and he touched them. Get up. Get up. Don't be afraid. When they looked up, they saw, they saw no one except Jesus. As they were coming down from the mountain, Jesus instructed them, Don't tell anyone what you have seen until the Son of Man has been raised from the dead. Do you think Jesus, do you think Peter believes that there's going to be a second coming? He experienced the power of God. You know, Peter was saying to them, and I can tell you, he was saying, by my own personal witness, I, I witnessed a miracle that day. And you should have no doubt that Christ will come again. I saw him transformed in all his glory. And I heard the very words of God. Who are you going to believe? Me who walked and talked and witnessed such miracles that I will die for Christ or a trickster false prophet. And you and I know today, history tells us that Peter died a martyr for his faith. Who are we going to believe? Truth checkers. You know, we live in a world today in which so many need to wake up and see that the miracles of Jesus Christ not only took place in his time, but they take place today too, don't they? 
You know, we're scared to say that sometimes, but does God answer prayer? Yes. yes. That's a miracle, isn't it? Yes. In itself. You know, in the 19th verse, then Peter is going to explain Jesus Christ in a very poetic way. He says, moreover, we have a prophetic word made sure to which we do to pay do well to pay attention as a lamp shining in a dark place until the day dawns and the morning star rises in your hearts. He's describing Jesus as a lamp to show you the way. In darkness, you know, we're, we're privileged to be able to stay in a beautiful home right now, but it's, we're not familiar with that home. And at 2.30 in the morning, I usually have to get up to do something. My bladder's just not strong enough to last all night anymore. And I, and I got up and it was dark and I couldn't find the bathroom. And then I remembered, wait a minute, in my bag I put a flashlight. I went and got the flashlight and guess what? I could find the way. Jesus was the lamp. He's the way, isn't he? You know, when darkness overcomes the day, the morning star rises to give you a direction to follow. In Revelations 22, 16, it says, Jesus said, I, Jesus, sent my angel to testify to you these things for the churches. I am the root and offspring of David, the bright morning star. Peter was talking about Jesus in that scripture, wasn't he? He will show you the way. For we need somebody today, don't we? Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but through me. There's no other way. A lot of people are going to try to convince you there's another way. But there's no other way. Jesus is, as he said, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father but through me. And he said in John 8, 24, Truly, truly, I say to you, he who hears my word and believes him who sent me has eternal life and does not come into judgment but has passed out of life or out of death into life. That's a promise, isn't it? Let me say that again. In John 8, 24, Truly, truly, I say to you, he who hears my words and believes him who sent me has eternal life and does not come into judgment, but has passed out of death into life. I spent the last 11 years serving as a psychologist for the Department of Corrections. And every time I would meet with uh, an offender, I would ask uh, do you mind it if I find out why you were locked up? And he said, I didn't do anything. I said, what do you mean? You, we just locked you up? Yeah, there's a mistake in the, in the system. Well, in front of me, I usually had his sheet there. And usually he had 8, 10, 12 arrests. And he had usually one or two other times being in prison. But he was going to swear to me that he was framed this time. With Jesus Christ, we don't even face a judgment, do we? Because he says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but through me. That was an eye-opening experience for me. I, uh, I shared not too long ago that I came, my, I, when I was 15 years old, I got mixed up in the wrong group of kids, and I got arrested and I got put in a juvenile detention center. My last job was running a juvenile detention facility. And when my mother passed away, uh, when, when I joined the military, the military had my record expunged, wiped away. Jesus does that for us, by the way, doesn't he? And I thought, boy, nobody will ever really know unless I tell them that I spent some time in a juvenile detention facility. But I went through my mother's papers and lo and behold, she saved my mug photo. <laughs> there it was, 15 and a half year old kid. 
You know, and it said that, and it was in the state of New Mexico, it said Department of Corrections, State of New Mexico. Walter D. Steele. That was me. And I was running a facility that had 75 juvenile offenders, probably many of them similar as me. And I used to take my mug photo around to them, and I would say, see this kid? And they'd say, yeah. I said, you know, he changed his life. And they would say, what do you mean? I said, that was me. And I'm running this facility now that you're in. You can change your life. Is that true today? Can anybody change? Yes. No. My, I didn't have the privilege to go to my 50th high school reunion, but I heard from many of my high school reunionettes. And they said, Wally, what do you do? And I said, well, first off, my first career was as a minister. You're kidding. <laughs> you were a minister? Yeah, I, I was a minister. Wait a minute, wait a minute. You were a minister? I said, yeah. And I said, I, I, I retired from the ministry, and, and I went back to college, and I got my degree in psychology. And I was hired by the state of South Dakota to rewrite juvenile corrections in South Dakota. You did what? <laughs> I said, yes, I did. And then they said, how did that happen? And guess what I told them? Jesus Christ changed my life. Amen. When I got out of the juvenile detention facility, I was 16 years old. My grandmother was worried that I was going to continue and going to end up in hell. And she invited me to church. Last time I was here, I told you my father was anti-church. He didn't, allow, he didn't allow anything about church to be mentioned in our home. We didn't have a Bible. We didn't have anything. But he wasn't going to battle Grandma. When she invited me to church, he said, OK, if you can get him to go, that's your business. Well, I turned her down. So Grandma was smart. She went to church next Sunday. And she looked around the church, and she, she counted the number of girls in church. <laughs> And she came back and she said to me, last Sunday, I looked around the church and I counted seven girls for every boy your age. I said, woo, wow. <laughs> I married one of those girls. Awesome. Pat and I have known each other since we were 16 and 17 or 15 and 16. I can't remember anymore. I dated her last. Dated all the other six first. <laughs> then I dated Pat. She was just too darn skinny when I first saw her there. But, but she grew up and matured. And, and when I was going to marry her, I asked, was I going to ask her to marry me? She said, I can't marry you. And I said, what do you mean? She said, you're not a Christian. She said, I have committed my life to Jesus Christ, and I am only going to marry a Christian. I said, well, I can take care of that. So I went up to the minister, and his name, you know, at that point was Dr. Lester Ford. And I went up to him, and I said, um, Dr. Ford, I, I want to be a Christian. And he said, do you believe in Jesus Christ? And I've been going to Sunday school. I said, sure, I believe. He said, well, next Sunday, I want you to come up here. And when you come up, I'm going to ask you, do you believe in Jesus? And you say you do, right? I said, yeah, I, I do. He said, um, you, you tell me that. We're going to go back into the baptistry. And I'm going to lower you down in the water. And I'm going to raise you up. And you're going to be a Christian. I said, whoopee, this is great. I can do that. And I did. And the first thing I did was go to pout. <laughs> And I said, you have to marry me now. I'm a Christian. Well, the church said we did our job. Got that kid dunked. Did our job. I got drafted one month, or Pat and I got married. And got married August 5th. And on September 26th, a draft notice came in the mail. 
And my father was career Air Force, and he said, I don't want you to go in the Army, Wally. I want you to go down to the Air Force. He knew the recruiter, got me down, and I was gone to basic training that day. For the next five years, I made Pat's life miserable. Every time she wanted to go to church, I found every reason not to. The pews are too hard. The minister didn't wear a tie or he had cowboy boots on. Or I could come up with all kinds of great excuses. Pat was the foundation of my life. She really was. She was a solid, dedicated Christian. I really, you know, felt bad about that, but you see, God hadn't changed my life yet. I had just gone through the motion. Well, the military had a, has a neat way of doing things. Uh, I was in the Air Force stationed in my hometown of Albuquerque, New Mexico, and the Air Force gave me orders to go to Japan. Uh, now, my wife, Pat, had never been anywhere but Albuquerque, New Mexico, and I said to Pat, we, we're going to get transferred to Japan. Pat said, where? I said, well, it's better than other places we could go, kid. So we went to Japan, they closed the base, and they sent me to Okinawa. And we had already had one son born to us, and, and we had difficulty having children. And in Okinawa, Pat, by the grace of God, got pregnant again. And we were so anticipating, hopefully having a little girl. And Pat carried that baby nine months and went into labor. Everything seemed fine. We got to the hospital and there was a flurry of activity. And it wasn't like the first time. I, I thought, gosh, something doesn't seem right. The doctor came out and said to me, the baby that your wife is carrying is badly deformed. And it'll be born and only take a few breaths and it's gonna die. You need to go tell her. I said, what? You need to go tell her. Most terrifying thing I ever faced in my life, this godly woman that had worked so hard and so, she wanted this baby so badly. And I'm gonna walk in this room and I'm gonna tell her that the baby's gonna die. I walked in the room, or actually before then, I had teased a young man in my, my uh, section. His name was Clint Slape. He was a, a young Baptist Christian on fire for God. He would pass out religious tracts on marine bases. That's pretty, on fire for God. And I didn't know what, I had, I had smoked. I, back then I smoked and I used language that I'm not proud of today. And I made sure I always did it around him. But when I was in trouble, who did I call? I called Clint. And I said, Clint, here's the situation. Help me. And he said, I can't help you. But he said, Jesus Christ can. He said, can I pray with you? And I said, sure. He said, kneel down. I said, Clint, I'm in a waiting room. There's other people here. He said, do you want help or not? I knelt down and he prayed. I can't tell you what he prayed, but he prayed. I went into the room where Pat was, and Pat said to me, something's really wrong, isn't it? And I said, yes, honey. She said, uh, the baby's going to die, isn't it? And I said, yes. She said, you know what? That's okay. It'll be with Jesus today in heaven. Well, I was so lucky. I know Lee was a chaplain in the military, and, and I am so grateful that a chaplain came to me the next day and said, we need to plan the funeral service for the child that you lost. And Pat was still in the hospital. In fact, they, I had spent the night with her in the hospital, and they had uh, uh, sedated her so that uh, she would you know, rest peacefully for a while, and they were gonna keep her in the hospital for a while. I was gonna to have to do the funeral by myself. 
And this chaplain came and he talked to me and he said, um, we're going to do the funeral. He arranged for a casket to be made for the funeral. We, we, he said, do you want to go back to the States and bury the baby or, baby, or do you want to put it in the National Cemetery here in Okinawa? And I said, well, we'll put it in the cemetery here in Okinawa. And he said, uh, what scriptures would you like me to say for the funeral? Um, I don't know any scriptures. I didn't tell him that. I said, oh, you probably can come up with something. And he said, no problem. No problem. And the next day, we planned the funeral. Clint was standing next to me with his wife and a few guys from my office. And the hearse came up and he said, you go, you go carry the coffin. And I went and picked up that little wood coffin and I carried it over and, and put it on the, the place where they were going to bury the baby. And the chaplain began with scriptures. And here's the scriptures he used. And I'll read them to you. It's out of Matthew. Chapter 18 is the first one. And he said, At that time the disciples came to Jesus and asked, Who is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? He called a little child and had him stand among them. And he said, I tell you the truth, unless you change and become like little children, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. Therefore, whoever humbles themselves like this child is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. And then he'd read this one. Then the little children are brought to, for, to Jesus for him to place his hands on them and pray for them. But the disciples rebuked those who brought them. Jesus said, let the little children come to me. Do not hinder them. For the kingdom of heaven belongs to such as these. When he had placed his hands on them, he went on from there. What did Pat tell me that day when I went into that room? She said, it's okay. Today the baby will be with Jesus in heaven. And then with the scriptures that the chaplain used, my life changed on that spot. I told Pat, my life is going to change. I'm going to follow Jesus anywhere he takes me. Anywhere. Pat said, oh, God, thank you. My prayers have been answered. You see, I encountered the Holy Spirit, didn't I? You know, I encountered the comforter that Jesus sent that changed my life. You know, Peter felt that, didn't he? Now, Peter experienced walking on water. He experienced the transfiguration. He experienced Jesus raising the dead. He experienced miracle after miracle after miracle. And when Christ died, and he had told him over and over again, when I die three days later, what was going to happen? He was going to have a resurrection, wasn't he? And Peter was at the tomb waiting, wasn't he? He wasn't there. Peter was disappointed because his hero, Jesus Christ, died on the cross. And he wasn't there. And when the ladies came to Peter and said, the tomb is empty, Peter said, somebody must have stolen the body. Peter. That was Peter. Peter went fishing. South Dakota, I love to go fishing. I'm a fly fishing guy. Pat had a bed and breakfast for, for 10 years, and I was her fly fishing guide. I'd go out and teach those guys how to fly fish. I love fly fishing, but there is nothing worse than not catching any fish when you're out fishing. <laughs> Peter went fishing, and he was in the boat, and he's throwing that net out, and nothing was happening. And somebody from shore said, lower it over on this side. And he took the net, and he threw it on that side, and as he did, he began to pull that net in, and it was full 
of fish. At that moment, at that second, he realized who was on shore. The resurrected Jesus Christ. He jumped out of the boat, didn't walk on the water, but he walked through the water and he fell down and he worshiped Jesus Christ. That's what happened to me. We all need to have that experience, don't we? Because Jesus Christ is real and active today. Now, Peter wrote this last verse. He said, know this first of all. In, first, in 2 Peter, the first chapter, the 20th verse. Know this first of all, that there is no prophecy of Scripture that is a matter of a personal interpretation. For no prophecy ever came through hu human will, but rather human beings moved by the Holy Spirit spoke under the influence of God. That's a powerful scripture, isn't it? That's a powerful scripture. Those six verses out of 2 Peter speak so loudly. We need to read them over and over and over again. So what I want you to take with you today. First, be a truth checker in our world today. By using your Bible as your guide, find out what's right and what's wrong. You know, I'm afraid that in my lifetime, when I first went into the ministry, by the way, was right here in Chandler, Arizona. And I had been stationed at Williams Air Force Base. Remember I told you I had committed my life at that point in Okinawa to change my life? The military gave me a humanitarian reassignment, and they reassigned me to Williams Air Force Base in Arizona. I went to church every Sunday. And when you have a young couple in church, and you have a bunch of junior hires, you ask them to teach the junior high youth group. And they asked me to teach the junior high youth group. And Pat, actually, they asked Pat because she taught me the scripture and then I taught the junior high youth group. And the church and the youth group began to grow. The youth minister left and the elders of the church came to me and said, would you be our youth minister? We know you're getting out of the Air Force and going to Mesa Community College there. Would you be our youth minister? And I said, no. <laughs> and they said, we'll work with you. We'll help you. We'll teach you. The minister, Lynn Dietz, said, I will disciple you. And I said, okay. I began the ministry there and I served for the next 30 years. I went to Bible college after leaving the church there and the church at Chandler supported me through Bible college. They ordained me. I, uh, showed Cal my ordination certificate with the guys there to see if he knew any of the names. And they ordained me and they sent me out into the mission field. It all started that day when I walked into that room. And Pat said, it's okay. Today the baby will be with Jesus and the chaplain, by coincidence, right? Used those scriptures. My life changed. You know, I'm afraid today things have changed in my lifetime. So much so, the church used to influence society. Today, society influences the church. That's pretty scary to me. I just read a survey from Fuller School of Theology that said, today, 60% of churches support gay ministers. To me, that's sort of scary. Is society influencing the church today? Yes, it is. You know, first thing, be a truth checker. Second, know the power of Jesus Christ can change your life. It can change anybody's life here, can't it? Doesn't matter how old you are. I. Uh, I told my, I teach a, a Bible study of burned out ministers in Custer, South Dakota. 
We have ministers that come from all over that have had things happen to them in churches and they have, they're no longer teaching. And I said to them, I'm gonna send a resume to a church in Arizona and see if they would want a 74 year old minister. I've still got a lot of gas left in this tank. And I've got a lot of things I would like to do. And they said, you're crazy. <laughs> Not the first time I've heard that. <laughs> Pat tells me that all the time. Uh, but God can use you anytime, anywhere, anyhow, at any age. In fact, when we get older, we have a, hopefully a little more wisdom to be able to, to encounter people rather than some of the other ways. In John 14, 26, Jesus said, But the Counselor, the Holy Spirit, whom I will send in my name, will teach you all things and will remind you of all things. Listen to that voice within. You know, when I accepted Jesus Christ that day uh, back and they baptized me in the water, I accepted Jesus Christ, but I didn't understand what I was doing. I knew that there was something special about who, who he was and that he could change my life. And I really wanted to change my life. I, I didn't want to be the guy that uh, when I, Pat and I announced that we were going to get married, the ladies group in First Christian Church in Albuquerque, New Mexico had a prayer time because she was marrying him. <laughs> and it was true. First time I came to church, I had, of course it was in the 60s, and I had pink pants on. I had a t-shirt and I had my cigarettes rolled up on my sleeve. But you know what, they loved me. And, and I fell in love with Pat. She has been my foundation, my spiritual guide, my supporter, my partner for now 55 years. And when I came last time, I felt so half here because she was gonna stay in Custer. God can use all of us, can't he? Yes. You know, if you're here today and, and you're waiting for God to do something, you might want to come forward and, and pray with the elders up here as when we get ready to sing our invitation. You know, if you haven't accepted Jesus Christ, it would probably be the day to come forward and do that because he will change your life. Hopefully as radical as he changed mine. But he can make husbands better he can make wives better he can make us better parents but we have to trust him and do the truth checker so we're gonna get i'll let you guys get ready i'm very unpredictable so they didn't know when to come up and uh, but that's what's exciting isn't it you never know what I'm going to do or say. At least that's what Pat says. And, uh, everybody, let's stand, and we're going to sing our, our invitation hymn. And if you need somebody to pray for you, the elders, and I've learned these elders are very godly and spiritual men. If you need somebody to pray for you, come forward, and they will reach out and pray for you. If you want to accept Christ, it's time to come forward.